Welcome to Alexandria, your audio gateway to the ancient world. In Chapter 7, titled Rhea Silvia B.C. 800, we delve into the sacred order of the Vestal Virgins of ancient Rome, their solemn duties, and the dire consequences they faced upon breaking their vows. We also explore the founding of Alba Longa and the rise of the Silvi dynasty. This chapter culminates with the consecration of Rhea Silvia, a Vestal whose fate is intertwined with the destiny of Rome. Now, let's turn back the pages to 800 BC and uncover the legacy of Rhea Silvia. Rhea Silvia, BC 800. Rhea Silvia, the mother of Romulus, was a Vestal virgin who lived in the kingdom of Latium around 400 years after the death of Ennius. A Vestal virgin was a type of priestess who, like modern nuns, had to live in seclusion and dedicate themselves entirely to religious services. They were strictly forbidden, like nuns, from associating or interacting with men. Aeneas himself is said to have started the group of Vestal virgins and created the rituals and duties they were responsible for. These rituals and duties were dedicated to Vesta, the goddess of home. The fireside has always been seen as the center and symbol of home in all cultures and times. The worship of Vesta involved ceremonies that aimed to honor and elevate the fireside in the eyes of the people. Instead of using statues and altars like other gods, a representation of a fire stand, similar to the ones found in houses back then, was used. A fire was kept constantly burning on this sacred stand, and various rituals and ceremonies were performed around it to honor the virtues and pleasures of home, which it represented. These fire stands, as used by the ancients, were very different from the fireplaces of modern times. Modern fireplaces are recesses in chimneys with flues above for the passage of the smoke. The household fires of the ancients were placed in the center of the room, on a hearth or supporter, called the focus. This hearth was made of stone, brick, or bronze. The smoke escaped through openings in the roof. According to modern ideas, this might seem like an uncomfortable arrangement. However, it's important to consider that the climate in those countries was mild, so there was not much need for fire. Additionally, people during this time period had habits and activities that mostly took place outdoors, including a significant portion of their leisure activities. Still, the fireplace was, like it is for us, a symbol of home life. So, when they worshipped Vesta, the goddess of home, instead of using an altar, they had a designated area called a focus, which was essentially a fireplace. Instead of offering sacrifices, they maintained a continuous fire on the focus. The priestesses in charge of the fire were chosen as children, usually between the ages of six and ten. Once selected, they were dedicated to serving Vesta through solemn ceremonies. As virgins, they were obligated, under severe penalties, to maintain a pure and virtuous life. Just as the perpetual fire in the Temple of Vesta symbolized the fire of a household hearth, these Vestal virgins represented the maidens responsible for domestic duties in a household. Their life of seclusion and celibacy symbolized the innocence and purity that the institution of the family aims to protect. The duties of the Vestals were similar to those of domestic maidens. They had to watch the fire and ensure it never went out. They performed various rituals and ceremonies related to the worship of Vesta and maintained the cleanliness of the temple and shrines as well as the organization of sacred objects and tools, just like in a well-kept household. In summary, they were expected to embody purity, hard work, tidiness, order, and patience and vigilance, representing the ideal virtues of maidenhood within their designated sphere of responsibility at home. The harshest punishments were given to any Vestal virgin who broke her vows. While it is not known exactly what these punishments were in the early period, in later years in Rome, where the Vestal virgins lived, a man who enticed one of them away from her duties would be publicly whipped to death in the Roman Forum. 
The Vestal herself, when led away, would be taken to an underground cell that was covered with a vault. The cell could be reached through a pit. Inside the cell, there was a table, a lamp, and a small amount of food. The ladder to descend into the cell was located in the pit. The location for this awful preparation for punishment was close to one of the entrances to the city. When everything was ready, the unfortunate Vestal was brought out, leading a large public procession. She was accompanied by her friends and family, all mourning and lamenting her fate along the way. The ceremony, in short, was like a funeral, except that the person being mourned was still alive. Upon reaching the location, the poor criminal was taken down the ladder and placed on the bed in the cell. The helpers who did this then went back. The ladder was pulled up, soil was thrown in until the hole was filled, and the misguided girl was left to her destiny, which was, after her lamp had run out of oil and her food had run out, to gradually starve and finally die in darkness and hopelessness. If we truly want to honor the ancient pioneers of civilization and empire, we should look at their dedication to Vesta and the creation of rituals and traditions in her honor. This was not the worship of a false deity or idol, as Christian nations worship the spiritual and eternal Jehovah. Instead, it was the representation of an idea, a principle, and the most effective way to gain widespread respect during those primitive times. Even in our time in Christian countries, people erect a pole to honor liberty and place a cap on top of it. If, instead of the cap, they were to put a carved statue of liberty on top and gather below for periodic celebrations with games, music, and banners, we probably wouldn't call them idolaters. Similarly, Christian poets write odes and invocations to peace, disappointment, spring, beauty, where they personify an idea or principle and address it with adoration, as if it were a sentient being with magical and mysterious powers. Likewise, the rituals and celebrations of ancient times should not all be considered as idolatry or condemned as wicked and absurd. Our fathers established an image to honor liberty, aiming to strengthen the influence of love for liberty among the general public. It's possible that Aeneas saw it in a similar way when he created a public fireside to symbolize domestic peace and happiness, and appointed maidens to guard it with constant vigilance and purity. In any case, this institution had a significant and immeasurable impact on the minds of people in those primitive times, instilling a sense of the sacredness of family ties and promoting ideals of honor and purity within households. It's important to note that they didn't have the word of God or any means of widespread education and enlightenment. Therefore, they had to rely on the best methods they could come up with using their ingenuity. There were many special rituals and ceremonies associated with the Vestal Altar, along with unique rules for its operation. It is difficult to determine the exact origin and purpose of these practices. As mentioned before, the young virgins were selected for this role at a minimum age of six and a maximum age of ten. They were chosen by the king, and it was necessary that the candidate, in addition to the mentioned requirement regarding age, should be in excellent physical and mental health. It was also required that she should be the daughter of parents who were free and had never been enslaved or engaged in demeaning occupations. Both her parents should also be alive. Being an orphan was considered, to some extent, a flaw. The service of the Vestal Virgins lasted for 30 years. After this time, the maidens were released from their vows and had the option to stop being Vestal Virgins. They could return to normal life, including the possibility of getting married. Although the laws allowed it, there was a public opinion against it, and it was rare for any of the Vestal priestesses to use this privilege. They usually stayed at the temple even after their service ended and died while serving the goddess. One of the main duties of the virgins in their service at the temple was to keep the sacred fire constantly burning. This fire was always supposed to stay lit, and if, due to any negligence from the vestal maiden in charge, it went out, she would be punished severely by being whipped. The punishment was carried out by the highest official of the state. 
the laws of the institution showed their respect for the purity and modesty of the Vestal Maidens by requiring that the punishment should be given in the dark. Beforehand, the maiden would be partially undressed by her female attendants. Afterward, the extinguished fire would be lit again with many solemn rituals. Rhea Silvia, who was the mother of Romulus, was a Vestal virgin. She lived 400 years after the death of Aeneas. During this time, the kingdom was governed by the offspring of Aeneas. Generally, they ruled peacefully and the kingdom prospered. However, there were some challenges in establishing the succession right after Aeneas's death. It is important to note that Aeneas drowned during the war. He had one son, and possibly more. The son who played the most significant role in the kingdom's future history was Ascanius. Ascanius had accompanied Aeneas from Troy and had now reached adulthood. Naturally, upon his father's death, he promptly became the new ruler. There was some question whether Lavinia herself was entitled to the kingdom. According to the laws and customs of that time, it was uncertain whether Aeneas held the realm as his own right or as the husband of Lavinia, who was the daughter and heir of Latinus, the ancient and rightful king. However, Lavinia did not seem inclined to assert her claim. She had a calm and gentle nature, and her health at that time made her desire solitude and rest. She was even afraid for her own safety, unsure if Ascanius would be suspicious and jealous of her because of her claims to the throne, and he might harm her. Her husband had been her only protector among the Trojans, and now that he was gone and someone else, who was somewhat her rival, had come into power, she naturally felt insecure. So she took the first chance to leave Lavinium. She went into the forests in the country's interior with a few attendants and friends and hid there in a safe place. The family that took care of her was Tyrius's family, who was the leader of her father's shepherds. Tyrius's children's stag Ascanius had killed before. In a short time, she had a son there. She decided to name him after his father and to remember that he was born in the wild forest scenes that surrounded her at that time. She called him Aeneas of the Woods, or Aeneas Silvius, in the language used in Latium back then. The boy was always known by this name in later history, and not only did he keep the name himself, but he passed it down to his descendants. All the kings that came after him for 400 years had the word Silvius added to their names. This was to always remember the special birth of their ancestor. Romulus's mother, Rhea, who we mentioned before and we'll talk about more later, was called Rhea Silvia because she was a princess from this royal family. Ascanius was busy with the war after his father's death, so he didn't pay much attention to Lavinia leaving. The king of the Rutulians who fought against him was Mezentius. Mezentius had a son named Lausus, and both father and son were serving in the army that was besieging Ascanius in Lavinium. Mezentius was in command at the army's camp, which was located some distance away from the city. Lausus led a group of soldiers who had set up a strong position near the gates. In a dark and stormy night, Ascanius planned an attack. He gathered a determined group of followers and waited for signs of success from the lightning. When the time came, he gave the signal. The gates were opened, and the armed men quietly moved forward in the darkness until they reached Lausus's camp. They attacked the camp suddenly and loudly. The detachment was caught off guard, and many were captured or killed. Lausus died, too. After winning, the Trojan soldiers, led by Ascanius, went towards the main Rutulian army. Mesentius had already been warned about their arrival and was ready to retreat when they reached his camp. He ran away with all his troops towards the mountains. Ascanius and the Trojans chased after him. Mesentius stopped and tried to make himself strong on a hill. Ascanius surrounded the hill and soon forced his enemies to surrender. They made a peace agreement, and Mezentius and his troops later left the country, leaving Ascanius and Latium in peace. After settling his affairs to some extent, Ascanius started thinking about Lavinia. 
The Latin part of his subjects seemed unhappy that Lavinia had been forced to leave her own kingdom and give the throne to a stranger's son. Some even feared that she had been harmed or that Ascanius might eventually kill her once people started forgetting about her. As a result, the public began demanding Lavinia's return. Ascanius seemed willing to be fair in the situation. He found Lavinia and convinced her to come back to the capital with her son. Then, he made the decision to give Lavinium to her completely, as her own rightful territory. Ascanius left and started a new city for himself. He searched the surrounding area for a good location and eventually chose a spot just north of Lavinium, not too far away. The city's walls were built at the base of a mountain, on slightly higher ground that sloped downward. The mountain, which rose steeply on one side, provided a strong defense on that side. On the other side, there was a small lake with clear water. In front and slightly below, there were expansive, fertile plains. Ascanius chose this location for his city, and his men began constructing it. Some built the city walls, while others planned streets and built houses inside. Others worked on creating terraces on the mountain slope above for growing vineyards. These slopes faced south, resulting in flavorful and luxurious grapes. They also dug channels from the small lake to distribute water to the fields below for irrigation during the cultivation of crops. Thus, Ascanius chose a place that provided all the necessary resources for the people to live and protect themselves. The town was named Alba Longa because it was long in shape, with buildings stretching along the lake border. The name Long was used to differentiate it from another Alba. Ascanius ruled for 30 years in Alba Longa, while Lavinia ruled in Lavinium. They were friendly to each other and governed the country together in peace and harmony. Eventually, both of them passed away. Ascanius had a son named Eulus, while Ennius Silvius became Lavinia's successor. There were different opinions across the nation regarding the claims of these two princes. Some believed that Ennius, through his conquest, became the rightful ruler of Lydium, regardless of his marriage to Lavinia, and that his son Eulus should succeed him. Others argued that Lavinia belonged to the ancient and true royal line and that Aeneas Silvius, as her son and heir, should be the one to be crowned. And some suggested a solution to the problem by splitting Latium into two kingdoms— one part would be given to Eulus, with Alba Longa as its capital, and the other part would be given to Aeneas Silvius, with Lavinium as its capital. However, this idea was rejected. It was believed that these two small and weak kingdoms would not be able to protect themselves against other Italian nations in times of war. The matter was ultimately resolved through a different kind of agreement. It was decided that Latium would remain whole, and that Ennius Silvius, who was the son of both Ennius and Lavinia, and therefore represented both ruling branches, would become king. Meanwhile, Eulus and his descendants would hold a position of religious authority, which was only slightly less important than the sovereign power. Ennius Silvius and his descendants became kings, commanding the armies and directing the affairs of state. Meanwhile, Eulus and his family were elevated to the highest pontifical positions. This arrangement lasted for about 400 years, with little information available about this period. However, one event stood out and was remembered. There was a king named Tiberinus in the Silvii dynasty. During one of his battles with a neighboring nation, he tried to swim across the river that marked the border. However, he was swept away by the strong current and never seen again. Because of this incident, the river was named Tiber, preserving his memory. Prior to this event, the river was known as the Albula. Another incident is related, which is quite interesting, as it shows the ideas and customs of the times. One of the kings from the Silvian line was named Aladius. This Aladius wanted people to believe that he was a god. To achieve this, he came up with a plan to imitate the sound of thunder and the flashes of lightning at night from his palace on the banks of the lake at Alba Longa, using artificial means. 
he probably used similar methods to those used in modern theatrical spectacles for this purpose. However, the people were not fooled by this deception, although they soon made a mistake almost as ridiculous as believing in this fake thunder. On a subsequent occasion, possibly during a severe storm with heavy rain in the surrounding mountains, the lake rose so high that it caused a flood. The water entered the palace, and the person pretending to be a thunder god drowned. People believed that he was destroyed as a punishment for his blasphemy in pretending to possess the power of a god. It was rumored and recorded by one historian that Aladias was struck by lightning during a storm and killed instantly before the palace was flooded. If someone died suddenly and in an unusual way, it is not surprising that people believed it was God's judgment. In those days, thunder was greatly feared and respected. But things have changed now. We have learned to understand thunder and protect ourselves from its power. Thanks to Franklin and Morse, we have started to control this powerful and mysterious force. So, it is not far-fetched to imagine that one day, human science might be able to create thunder in the sky, just like it can be created on a lecturer's table. Finally, after 400 years of the Silvii dynasty ruling over Latium, a king from the dynasty passed away, leaving behind two children, Numitor and Amulius. Numitor was the older son and should have been the rightful heir. However, he was quiet and somewhat ineffective, while his younger brother was passionate, ambitious, and likely to desire power. The father expected that there might be disagreement between his sons after he died. To prevent this, he tried to settle the inheritance before his death. During the negotiations, Amulius suggested splitting their father's possessions into two parts, the kingdom and the wealth and treasures. Numitor would get to choose which part he wanted. This proposal appeared reasonable and fair, but it would have been truly fair if both the younger and elder son had an equal right to the inheritance being discussed. However, that was not the case. So, in essence, Amulius was suggesting to share something that actually belonged entirely to his brother. Numitor, who didn't seem inclined to fight for his rights, agreed to this proposal. He chose the kingdom for himself and left the wealth for his brother. Therefore, when their father passed away, the inheritance was divided accordingly. But Amulius, after acquiring his treasures, used them to gain influential allies and increase his political power. Eventually, he seized the throne, and Numitor, not putting up much resistance against the takeover, fled and hid in a secluded location. He had two children, a son and a daughter, whom he left behind in his flight. Amulius was worried that these children might cause trouble in the future by claiming to be their father's heirs. He couldn't kill them openly because it would make people dislike him. So he had to use trickery. The son, named Agestus, was killed during a hunting party. Merciless and desperate men were hired to shoot him with arrows or stab him with a spear during the chase, taking advantage of moments when they were not seen or when it could be seen as an accident. The daughter, named Rhea Silvia, mentioned earlier in this chapter, couldn't be killed openly without being suspected of her murder. Additionally, he may have still had some humanity left in him, not wanting to harm a defenseless and beautiful young girl who happened to be his own brother's daughter. Moreover, he had his own daughter named Anto, who was Rhea's friend and companion. He might have felt some understanding towards their bond as cousins. He decided not to kill the child, but instead planned to make her a Vestal Virgin. This way, she would be dedicated to religious service, which would prevent her from trying to become queen. And by taking vows as a Vestal Virgin, she would be unable to have any children who could challenge his claim to the throne. There was nothing very special about this event of his niece becoming a princess and serving as a vestal firekeeper. It was common for children from noble families to be chosen for this role. The young Rhea, who was still a child when her uncle made this decision about her, didn't seem to object to what she may have seen as a special honor. So the consecration ceremonies were carried out as planned. She took the vows and committed herself, 
without fully understanding the consequences, to live a life of complete celibacy and seclusion. She was then accepted into the Temple of Vesta, where she joined other maidens who had been consecrated before her. She faithfully carried out her duties as a Vestal Virgin for many years. However, certain events occurred that abruptly ended Rhea's time as a Vestal Virgin and had significant consequences. These events will be explained in the next chapter. As we close the chapter on Rhea Silvia and the sacred Vestal traditions of ancient Rome, we stand at the brink of an even more profound tale. Thank you for being with us through this narrative, steeped in the rituals and dynastic shifts that prelude the birth of a great city. If your curiosity is piqued and you yearn to continue this historical tapestry, Chapter 8, The Twins, is ready to unveil the next critical epoch. Just click the video appearing on your screen or visit the link in the description to proceed. Don't forget to subscribe to Alexandria, for more chapters of enthralling history, and please leave a like if you've enjoyed the journey so far. Share this video with others who appreciate the legacy of our past, and together, let's keep the stories of yesteryears alive. Until we meet again in Chapter 8, farewell and may the annals of history continue to inspire your days.